Hello, you are welcome to Paco Network Expert Groups. Today we discuss about the result of the April war between Azerbaijan and Armenia. What do you think? What has happened between our country and our neighbors? What do you think? Uh, well, happened what has been happening uh, every year since uh, 1994 when the ceasefire was signed, where there was yet another provocation. Uh, I think um, now, though, the situation has become uh, very much different. Azerbaijan is a different country. Uh, Armenia is a different country. And so they both found themselves uh, in this very complex situation. Uh, Azerbaijani army was able to liberate uh, some of its lands and therefore um, tactically it's a major success by the Azerbaijani army and the uh, Armenian government uh, has acknowledged that at this point. So um, right now I think we should be thinking more about the future. Uh, this type of situation shouldn't have to uh, happen every single year. Uh, innocent people on both sides, uh, especially civilians, should not have to lose their lives. Uh, it's about time for the Armenian government to really comply with the four UN Security Council resolutions for which all five permanent members have voted, including the United States, including Russia, France, China, UK, and uh, withdraw all of their uh, occupying forces from Azerbaijani lands. Uh, let people live in peace, uh, let the Armenian community there enjoy their lives in a country that's much richer uh, than the Republic of Armenia, uh, enjoy all the great opportunities that are uh, offered to everybody who lives in Azerbaijan, a very tolerant, very multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious nation that can really set the standard for uh, not only diversity but tolerance and uh, how uh, countries with such uh, diverse populations should be developing economically and otherwise. Yeah. But war every time it's uh, pity, it's not good, but this conflict push negotiation process, I think. Mm. Yeah. What do you think? What situation about negotiation process between Armenia and Azerbaijan? Well, ultimately, these uh, you know hostilities uh, that uh, occurred during uh, four days in uh, April, they uh, triggered yeah. the <laughs> diplomatic process, and uh, I believe that the uh, regional and the world powers they <laughs> realized that this uh, ceasefire and uh, negotiations have to produce uh, a tangible result. Otherwise, uh, you know, this can lead to the major regional instability where the regional powers can get involved, engaged in these uh, hostilities to support either uh, side. And uh, I believe that uh, the clear message to the peace uh, brokering powers from Azerbaijan was also that enough is uh, enough and our patience is uh, running out. Yeah. Not only the Azerbaijani territories, uh, which is just more than one-fifth of Azerbaijan's, if Nagorno-Karabakh, but over 20% of Azerbaijan is under occupation today. And the shelling from the occupied territories yeah. to the other Country. villages that are adjacent to the occupied territories I think is a demonstration of emboldened position of uh, Yerevan. And uh, <clears throat> why I say emboldened, because they've been allowed to behave that way, you know. Either they were getting a support from regional powers, they were getting humanitarian aid from the EU, from the United States, and they thought that they are invincible. And I think this clear message that Azerbaijan is no longer the country that is just coming out of the ashes of the demise of USSR and is very much weakened because the Soviet powers never allowed Azerbaijan to get its you know, military and get stronger to defend itself. So in that sense, I think that uh, Azerbaijan demonstrated its military power, but also spiritual preparedness and patriotic 
will on the part of the population and even Azerbaijanis living outside of uh, Azerbaijan to demonstrate that every single Azeri is uh, willing to stand behind its motherland, its uh, homeland, and demonstrate it. And maybe when, when Azerbaijan, when we lost those territories, maybe for some reason our morale on a national level was low, you know. Both our military and morale was low. But today, I think the <coughs> military preparedness and the morale is very high, and I think it uh, gives a clear message to the peace brokers that if we don't reach any tangible result, result and we're not able to corner Armenia to sort of cooperate and withdraw from the occupied territories, Azerbaijan is no longer is willing to get a soft pillow, you know, under its head. And the situation is changed. Yeah. We have new uh, situation. What can weight of uh, international uh, organization or our neighbors or different powerful countries or members of uh, Minsk group negotiations? What we can do? Um, when it comes to this conflict, um, Azerbaijan definitely has upper hand. It has already sent uh, its message to international community that Azerbaijan will never reconcile with the fact that 20% of Azerbaijan's historic legitimate lands are under occupation. So before this, uh, before this four-day war began, uh, there were some uh, assumptions that eventually Azerbaijan will uh, make some compromise, will uh, reconcile uh, with Armenia's uh, occupation, will uh, give up certain um, uh, benefits, but uh, this war sent a very strong message to the international community, to all organizations who are watching this conflict very closely. Uh, it proved one more time that um, Azerbaijan, no matter how many years will pass, no matter uh, how far Armenia Long time will wait, but without any result. Yeah, but I agree it was uh, too long, but um, as uh, Jay Humel indicated, that despite the fact that it has been <clears throat> almost 25 years since uh, the first Karabakh war uh, ended, but Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis around the world, they have proved that uh, we are still strong. We are still waiting for final end to this conflict, and we are still waiting uh, to solve this problem in terms of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. Uh, that's the message. That's the message the international community is getting today. Um, and they, they understand that um, there will never be a status quo. Azerbaijan will never accept this, uh, this um, Armenian-initiated status quo. Yeah. So also it showed that uh, another uh, benefit for Azerbaijan is that um, uh, it showed one more time that um, no country will ever uh, have any strength to recognize Armenian-invented puppet regime in the heart of Azerbaijan. Okay. Uh, sometimes I argue, I have a lot of arguments with um, Armenians, Armenian lobbies. They keep saying, uh, yes, now it's, it has been 25 years. Now the so-called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic is not independent. Uh, it, it will never turn back. It will never be under Azerbaijan's uh, constitution. But it shows, the recent, including the recent events, they show that um, if that was true democracy, if that was true uh, uh, free country, it would have been recognized a long time ago, just like Kosovo or East Timor or Darfur. But it shows one more time that international community doesn't take this so-called independence, so-called this self-proclaimed uh, independence very seriously. They still treat this event, uh, they still treat this occupation as occupation by another country, which is, of course, Armenia. Yeah. But Armenia, no one take uh, his army, occupation army, uh, return for Armenian, not take some uh, uh, understandable position of uh, in negotiation process. What we can do? What we can do to uh, take process in forward? What we can do? Well, that's a very difficult question. If I had a real answer to it, uh, I think uh, we wouldn't be sitting there, uh, we'd be uh, implementing it. 
there are a couple of things, though. Well, number one, Azerbaijan has to get stronger. It has to get stronger in every possible way, from uh, economic and financial to uh, security and military to, of course, diplomacy and uh, politics and in many other respects. Uh, it has to also invest much more in education, uh, including higher education. It has to produce a higher caliber of professionals, uh, everybody from diplomats to historians. Uh, we don't have a lot of Azerbaijani professors, for example, uh, uh, either studying or reading lectures um, uh, abroad in uh, major universities. We also don't have a single book on Azerbaijani history, including about Karabakh, published anywhere in the world by an authoritative uh, publishing house, uh, whereas the Armenian side has many such books published. So uh, this shows one side of the problem. Uh, another side of the problem is Azerbaijani message uh, is not very well known and does not get through so much. And this is something that today uh, I think many of us have heard from the president of Azerbaijan. He's been lamenting about this, that uh, uh, the media uh, throughout the world is not, um, is not printing Azerbaijan's message so much and instead uh, prints uh, Armenia's message. So if this is a problem uh, and it has been identified uh, as a problem, then Azerbaijan should have some concrete steps and a plan of how to bridge that gap, how to make sure that this is not a problem in the next few years. And uh, to do that, it has to rely mostly on its own. It has to rely on its own resources. It cannot buy itself out. It cannot buy its way out of this because Unfortunately, this is part of the mentality that a lot of people have where we can just pay to somebody and someone can help. No, uh, when you pay, you get a certain help up to a certain way, but you cannot get it all the way. So that means you have to invest in your own resources, in your own uh, people, in your own potential. And Azerbaijan has a lot of very talented people. It has a lot of uh, very promising young people who can, uh, who can do many things, who can achieve many things, if they invest in them more. So I think education would be the answer, uh, but of course this is all long term. So, um, and I understand that patience is running out, and so uh, I, I understand that you would like this to happen much faster because you've been waiting for 25 years. Uh, so it's only reasonable that you want us to end as soon as possible, but unfortunately it will take some more time um, but it is possible to, uh, to get some major uh, resolution done in the next five to ten years, let's say, which is not that long to wait. We have a lot of uh, young people who study abroad. Of course, we're working. Our country, it's dynamic. There are many, yeah, that's true. Working. But not enough. That's not enough. Not enough, of course. Having 5,000 <laughs> students studying abroad is not enough. Yeah. Uh, a country like Azerbaijan in this type of tough neighborhood yeah. should have not 5,000, but 50,000 people studying abroad. Yeah. Azerbaijan has enough money to afford this. Yeah, we feel the same situation. Because in the conflict time, we don't hurt some exactly. our experts, in, exactly. for example, in Russia or... Yeah. Uh, including our Georgia neighbors, yeah. brother country. And this field for us, it's a neat, um, improved situation. That's true, that's true. You, there isn't much anywhere in Europe, there isn't yeah. much anywhere in Asia, in fact, not even in Iran, for example, a yeah. neighboring country or Central Asia. Uh, yeah. So therefore, you can't really expect anybody to know or feel anything for you, for Azerbaijan, if you cannot get your message across. Of course, we wait uh, negotiations between Azerbaijani president in Harmaliv and uh, Ser Sarkisyan, which will be in July. It's after a couple of, of weeks. And uh, I hope we do it better, our future. Thank you very much for our discuss about April conflict. I wish you all the best. Tuta for now. So.